Screenplay Formatting Part 2. We know from Part 1 that everything that you do in screenplay formatting has to do with instructions, basically, to the crew. What's the location? Who are the actors? What are the props? Uh, what are the lines of dialogue? Everything is meant to inform the crew as to what is being filmed. So remember, the screenplay is meant to be played. It's not meant to be read. Of course, it has to be read to be played, but it's a, one of those funny things about making movies. So today, we're going to start with Knives Out. Uh, if you go to Ryan Johnson's website, um, I've downloaded his screenplay for Knives Out. He uh, generously puts them on his website. And if you don't know Ryan Johnson, of course, he, he did uh, Knives Out and Brick, uh, one of the Star Wars pictures, uh, So he's and Looper. Uh, he's um, a, a very uh, good filmmaker and a good writer. So uh, he's very generous, and he puts this stuff out there for you to look at. So if you go, I can't find the screenplays online, just go to Ryan Johnson's website, and he gives them to you. Uh, I've linked that in uh, down below. So Knives Out, A Murder Mystery by Ryan Johnson. So let us start. Exterior, Thromby Estate Manor House, Dawn. The grounds of a New England manor, pre-dawn, misty. So here you have what's called the slug line. Is it an interior and exterior? Uh, Thromby Estate Manor House, so it's a main uh, location. And Dawn, so we have uh, cinematography uh, locations, what time of day we're going to be shooting. And uh, it's a manor house, so is it going to be a location that is scouted that we're going to use, or is it, say, a miniature that's going to be uh, built to scale on a soundstage? Uh, we don't, you know, these are all the, the questions you're going to ask uh, before you start shooting something like this, because they're going to want this to be a very particular kind of place. So do you build it, or do you, do you, you find a location that exists, or several locations that exist that can sort of fill in for this uh, place. Interior, manor, pantry, living room, foyer, hallway, dawn, inside the manor. So those of you who always ask, oh, how do I write uh, a montage? Well, he's writing one here, inside the manor. Unlit and still, gothic, with a theme of antique games, arcane puzzles, and decorative weapons. First floor, a drawing room, living room, kitchen, the detritus of a party, stray champagne flutes. So here it's just gathered image, whether a second unit would do this or if you're a small production, the main unit's going to pick all this stuff up. But these are all of these little pieces that we're going to put together. And someone's paying very close attention to here, and that's the, that's the art department, because all of these things are going to have to be made or found or bought, something. Interior, Thromby Estate, second floor, Dawn. Follow one housekeeper named Fran, carrying a tray of coffee up a flight of stairs. Second floor, a hallway, doors all closed, the house is not woken up, and Fran steps lightly up a much narrower, creaky flight of steep stairs. So two things here. Capitalize Fran, first time Fran is uh, in, the, in the movie, so we capitalize the first time she appears. Don't have to do that afterwards, so casting is obviously paying attention here. And there's a cue here, there's two cues actually. Follow housekeeper, so he's the director, so he's saying to himself like a steady cam shot uh, or a handheld shot of following her through this space. And the second person that's being talked to here is the production designer. When she goes up a narrower, creaky flight of steep stairs, we're telling them something. Interior, Thromby Estate, third floor, master bedroom, Dawn. Third floor, the master bedroom suite. Fran, dialogue. Morning, Mr. Thromby. But the bed is empty, unslept in, a robe thrown across it. Fran heads out onto the landing and up an even narrower half flight of stairs, which leads to a single door. So again, we're talking directly to the production design here. Even narrower, so they already know again, a narrow flight of stairs to a narrower flight of stairs. So all this stuff that's being built, presumably in a soundstage, is going to pay attention to these things. So the writer is writing to um, the production designer, the writing to... Um, the art department, the writing to the director, even though he is the director. Interior, Harlan Thromby's study, Dawn. A cramped attic study, every shelf crammed with curios. The door swings open and Fran sees Harlan Thromby himself, 85 years old, 
slung across a white leather daybed, throat slit, dredged to blood, very much dead. Cut to title card on black, then two. The thing I like about this uh, from a, a screenwriter's standpoint is that it, it is like haiku. It's like these very short um, descriptions and everything's very poetic and you don't need to go into these large explanations. You're not, you're not writing this for an audience uh, uh, of readers. You're writing this for an audience of craftspeople. So everything that is said here, you know, the production designer is going to do way better than the writer in terms of visualizing this space. And they're going to come to the director and the writer, at, in this case, um, with their designs. And they're going to blow you away. And then they're going to build it. And then it's going to blow you away again. So, you know, when you're writing a movie, you, don't, you as the writer don't have to be the architect of everything. You have to be the suggester of everything. We changed location. Interior, Marta's bedroom, morning. Marta Cabrera wakes up with a cry. Plain, modern, cramped. Marta, in her late 20s, takes a moment to catch her breath, opens a window. Exterior, South Boston Housing Project, morning. A tiny window in a cheap apartment building opens. Marta's face appears, breathing deep. Super, one week later. Interior, Cabrera Kitchen, morning. Marta sits in front of a laptop. Her mom is at the table with her. Her sister Alice watches CSI on an iPad on the countertop, murder-related dialogue from the show. Marta scrolls through a job site, tired, eyes dead. Her mom watches, concerned. Mom, dialogue. Alice, turn that off now. And now we get into dialogue that is overlapping. And this is how you would write overlapping dialogue. Why? It's almost over. Now, please, just what? turn it off. Finding out who did it and the Wi-Fi sucks in my room. Turn so it off play. now. Like two left. Alice, What? There isn't off. even anything bad on it. It's just normal. A lot of people don't use overlapping dialogue in film because overlapping dialogue is a pain to cut. Um, you have to shoot them all together. You can't do singles on overlapping dialogue. Or if you do, everyone needs to know wh which is important in terms of which dialogue is important because it's all going to get mashed together. And even though you are laving everyone with their separate mics, your dialogue is going to bleed onto the other person's mic. So it all gets mashed together. So when you're trying to cut between characters, you say this line, I say that line, you say this line, you don't have clean cuts for the editor, so you have to really have confidence in, in do this, uh, doing overlapping dialogue. And a couple of filmmakers are famous at it. Uh, Robert Altman would use overlapping dialogue all the time, as would Orson Welles. Orson Welles loved doing doing it. And sometimes people complain. It's gets, it gets muddy. Uh, you can't understand. A, nothing in particular gets punctuated. I think nowadays the way we record, you can do a lot better than that. But still, you're going to have dialogue that is going to get baked together. Marta. Thanks, Mom. I love you. God, none of this seems real. Alice, you can keep watching your show. It's all right. Alice. No, I guess you did it anyway. I'm sorry, Marta. Alice hugs her sister. Marta's phone rings. Walter Thromby. Marta. It's Harlan's son. Maybe it's about the funeral. She answers. Hi, Walt. Listens. Uh-huh. Her face shifts in confusion. What? So here, the parentheticals is her answering and her listening, so we don't hear the person on the other line. Exterior, private road, late morning. A long, narrow private road leading to the Thromby estate. Marta's shitty, subcompact car buzzes by towards the house. Exterior, Thromby estate, front drive. Several cars, including a police cruiser with a few uniformed officers by it. Marta pulls up. An officer eyes her, approaches. Cop, excuse me, ma'am. Are you with the help? Meg. Thromby's college-aged granddaughter trots out. Hey, her name is Marta. She was granddad's nurse. She's with us. The help? What the hell? Overlapping dialogue again. They hug and are both instantly crying. They laugh. Meg, oh God, look at us. How are you? This week. How have you... Meg says, yeah, it's been rough. The whole week's just awful. And now this. She looks at the cop cars. We thought we were done. Marta... Walt called me, but yeah, I thought the cops got our statements already. What are we... I don't know. They've got more dumbass questions, something dumb. She vapes. How are you doing? Not good. Alone. Lots of just this. The crying. And not knowing what to do next. Meg says, anything you need. You're a part of this family, Marta. Marta says, thanks. Takes a beat. I want to ask you, but I didn't want to bother you guys. I didn't hear anything... 
is the funeral, is there a day for it, or? Meg says, it was yesterday. Marta's face falls. Marta, I told them that all of you, Fran, everyone who worked with them, should have been there. You were closer to Granddad than anyone in the past few years. But they got on this whole roll about it was for the family and it was a family thing. They took a vote and we got outvoted. So sorry. It's okay, says Marta. It's not okay, says Meg. This idiot family. They both start laughing. So there you have basic screenplay formatting. Dialogue, action, in between the dialogue, uh, parentheticals to make suggestions. Small suggestions do not fill up the parentheticals with action. And your slug lines, you know, where, where is it that this is taking place? All of this, again, is to inform your cast, crew, producers, everyone involved in the, in the movie. The one thing I really like about this screenplay is it's, it's very well written. Like I said before, it's like haiku. It's very short. It's visual. But it's also like a great setup. You, you've, without even realizing it, you've gone through a lot of exposition here. And the exposition is both through the dialogue but through the visuals. You know, the, the visuals of the estate, Thromby's estate, uh, and then contrasting that with where Marta lives and her family, you know, living with her mom and her sister. So you, you are getting, you're getting this picture of a family without being told anything. You just realize, okay, here's a new character, but she doesn't live in this household, this grand household. Uh, and as the movie goes on from here, you're going to see interrogations. And in the interrogations, you're going to see more and more of this house that's quite extravagant. And, and then you say, well, how does Marta really fit into this world? So there's lots of information here that is, is just given out, and it's given out easily without any effort and we're investing in this already as an audience because we're four pages in, four or five minutes into the movie. We're starting to get a lay of the land and meeting everyone. And, you know, from here on out, you know, we know there's a murder. So the audience is immediate saying what, what's happened and what's going to happen. Who did this and how does this all play in and why, uh, why are we meeting Marta and how does she uh, play into this whole thing? So, uh, this is, a, this is how you structure a story. And it's really good exposition. It's really good writing. It's short and sweet. It's visual. The dialogue's good. The characters are being set up well. And again, but the, the, the dialogue isn't jumping off the screen, especially the way I'm reading it. I'm just reading it as words on a page. But when it's performed by actors, that makes a whole lot of difference. So when we go to, um, you know, the first interrogation scenes, we meet Linda, who's played by Jamie Lee Curtis, all right, we're with Linda Drysdale, Nee Thromby, uh, Harlan Thromby's eldest daughter, and discussing the events that took place the night of his demise one week ago, November 8th. The casting is so important because the dialogue is going to be good, but the, the, the person inhabiting the person saying the dialogue is just as important in a movie. So at the bottom of page six, uh, Elliot checks his notes. So the whole family was gathered at the house that night for your father's 85th birthday party. Again, exposition. Yes. How was it? The party, pre my dad's death. Oh, it was great. Interior living room, night of the party, flashback. So if you're talking about how to do a flashback or something like this, this is how Ryan Johnson writes his. Warmly lit, classic rock playing, food laid out, Linda and Richard mingle happily with the rest of the family. We'll meet shortly. And notice he doesn't mind putting we'll meet shortly in here. It's, we're not writing a novel again. We're writing a screenplay. So it's just indicating to the reader that uh, we're going to meet more people. Lieutenant Elliot, voiceover. So VO is voiceover. Anyone besides the family there that night? Linda, also in voiceover. So this is coming over from the previous scene. Uh, the caterer is Fran, the housekeeper, Marta, Harlan's nurse, caretaker person, hard worker, good girl. Family from Ecuador and Juanetta, a great nana, dad's mom. At the snack table wearing a dozen coats, a woman who might be 300 years old. She pounds down chips and dip like a machine. Lieutenant Elliot, voiceover, wow. His mom? How old is she? Linda in voiceover, nobody knows. Elliot, your son Ransom, he lives in town, right? He was at the party too? Yes, but he left early. Ransom Drysdale, 
roguishly handsome in his early thirties, breezes out the side door past Great Nana. Great Nana. Ransom, are you leaving? So, uh, brand new character, he's capitalized. And you don't have to spend a lot of time on giving his backstory or character information. Uh, whoever reads this script is going to know who to cast for that uh, role and what kind of person that, that Ransom is and what kind of actor would be able to play such a person. You, Drysdale. Ransom. Call me Ransom. It's my middle name. Only the help called me Hugh. Okay. Uh, this is Trooper Wagner. I'm Lieutenant Elliot. I just want to ask a few questions. It's all down here on the page, but it's all meant to be played again. And and you can you can use shorthand as a screenwriter in order to uh, to get the story, keep the story moving on the page. And all of this is going to be filled in. Is in a novel, you would you type it all out in description. Here, it's all going to be filled in by casting, production design, lighting. You know, everyone who works on the movie is going to add a little element to this um, to these scenes and that's what makes movies fun but it makes them hard as well because there it's not just the person sitting at a at a you know a, a computer or 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 sitting with a piece of paper just writing out their dreams uh, it is going to be given over to a whole lot of people to realize this person's vision uh, and you know then the the fun of making a movie is not knowing exactly how it's going to turn out even writing a novel is that way too, but you know you're basically captain of your own ship at that point. And uh, here, uh, you know, you set it sail and uh, you hope for the best. It's costing you the least amount of money to write a good screenplay, uh, and it's going to do to make the film. Even a small film, like I said, costs uh, an enormous amount of money and a lot of effort. So uh, this is where you want to get most of it right, and it's going to change. I really think you should watch this movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, maybe read the script first and then check out the movie and do a little comparison because uh, it's interesting always to see, you know, what got left, what got changed, you know, what were the practical considerations that went into shooting this script. So, you know, it'd be a good exercise to read the script and then watch the movie. Or if you've seen the movie, read the script again and then watch the movie or do it any which way you want. Anyway, I'm going to sign off. You do that, uh, and I'll see you in the next one.